Thanks as well to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's always a great pleasure uh, to come to India. Uh, so I'm going to be reporting on joint working proce uh, process with um, Thomas Bayer, Michele Bolognesi, and Christian Pauli. Um, that sort of combines all of um, all of these things. So strictly speaking, it's um, it's perhaps not directly about Higgs bundles, but I thought that uh, in order to earn my keep here, that I should at least begin by mot giving a motivation that is uh, related to um, to Higgs bundles. So I'll give two pieces of motivations for which the second is really directly the question that we would like to tackle, but in some sense, philosophically speaking, um, the first one is very relevant as well. And this is essentially an old conjecture, by now old conjecture of Atia. So um, just to uh, very quickly recap a lot of the things that Laura has introduced, if I consider my moduli space of Higgs bundles, let's say for SLN, that's the only group I'll really be discussing today, which has a, has, which has our, the, oops, the Hitchin map, the base of the Hitchin, that I'll call the Hitchin space. Maybe I'll let sigma be a Riemann surface. Um, then inside of here, I can actually look at the modulized space of stable bundles, which I'll just denote like this, which is a little bit more of a key player for me. And now if I let pick a parameter in here, such that, um, so I'll pick a parameter in here such that um, the spectral curve as introduced by Laura is smooth, then I can think about the following. I really want to think about um, the spaces of abelian or non-abelian theta functions. And so in order to do that, I'm really particular about uh, thinking about non-abelian theta functions, thinking about a line bundle on here. So I have a space of non-abelian theta functions. It's just a space of global sections of some ample line bundle, k power of an ample generator um, over this moduli space. But in fact, um, and maybe I can just erase my title now, the line bundle also extends to the whole moduli space of Higgs bundles, and I can restrict it then to all of the fibers, which as we learned this week, um, are the prim varieties. Um, so in here, I'm also going to have some prim variety determined by my um, element that I'm here. And so I can restrict this guy as well. And so I find a um, line bundle over the prim variety that is in fact going to be um, the polarizing line bundle. Um, and I can now ask the question, to what I extent can I relate um, my space of abelian theta functions that I have here to my spaces, uh, sorry, my space of non-abelian theta functions that I have here to my abelian theta functions um, coming from, um, well, sections of this line bundle over this abelian variety as we are used to, so the, the very classical picture of theta functions. Um, and so what you can do is any section that you have here, you can, um, you can pull back to the full moduli space. And then, um, of course, there's a little bit of stability uh, that is happening in that when I pull it back, um, I get, uh, pull, well, I, I pull it back to the cotangent bundle of the moduli space, which sits in here. And then the rest is something of sufficiently high co-dimension that these sections extend. And so I really get a section here that I can now restrict to the uh, prim varieties. And so you, you, you have a way of sort of starting from a um, non-abelian theta function and ending up at an abelian theta function. And so you can ask the question, which ones do I get? Um, and so Atiyah conjectured in the late 80s that the space of non-abelian theta, or that all the non-abelian theta functions Corresponds to those um, 
abelian theta functions that are covariantly constant. And so here I want to place, take W to be the fundamental group of the Hitchin base. Let me call this guy H minus, um, let's call it W, the discriminant locus. So I'm essentially just doing exactly what Laura did. I'm only looking at, uh, the, at the locus inside the uh, Hitchin base where the spectral curves is smooth. So I take the fundamental group of that, and then it turns out that um, I can now consider my spaces of abelian theta functions as a vector bundle over this space that come equipped with a projectively flat connection over which I will say uh, much more later. Um, so we, we can now ask for um, covariantly constant sections. There's a bit of a project projectivity there, but it can manage, and so can be managed, and Atia conjectured that exactly uh, those abelian theta functions that are going to be obtained are going to be the ones um, that are covariantly constant, or if you think about, um, that are invariant under the, uh, the action of uh, this group W that you obtain this way. So I'm gonna, yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure, I think, he, I mean, he wrote it down in, only in type A, but I, you know, the, the basic, the, the basic idea is, uh, goes through, yeah, whatever, I mean, you just want to look at uh, smooth spectral curves or, um, it's, it's a very general conjecture, um, but I think he, strictly speaking, he only wrote it down in type A. So he wrote it down in his book, um, Geometry and Physics of Knots. Um, so this is often also known as the, uh, the abelianization conjecture. And strictly speaking, he conjectured even more, um, so these spaces, when you let your Riemann surface vary, uh, when you vary the complex structure, they also come equipped with a, um, with a connection, and he, and he actually conjectured that you could obtain the connection this way as well. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about this, um, this conjecture. The status of it is a little bit uncertain. About 10 years ago, um, a paper, paper appeared in Annals of Mathematics that um, proved this in the case of where the group was um, SL2, but then about a year later, a short preprint also appeared on the archive that exhibited a fatal flaw in the argument. And ever since, it seems no, no retraction has been uh, published or no correction has been published. So it's a little bit unclear what's going on. Um, I don't have any opinion about this, but I would like to sort of take this as a broader motivation. This is a very specific, um, uh, recipe, but you can ask the more broad question, to what extent can I um, express space of non-abelian theta functions in terms of abelian theta function? Maybe not arising through the Hitchin system. I'm going to be talking about another recipe today that in a very specific situation works. So that was the first piece of uh, motivation. But now more concretely, Um, and this is sort of justifying the Chern-Simons um, in the title of my talk. Um, so I already mentioned that both when you look at spaces of non-abelian theta functions or you look at spaces of, of ordinary abelian theta functions, that when you let the, the uh, complex structure of your curve vary, then you can think of these things as forming vector bundles, either over Teichmuller space or over the moduli space of curves. And um, these spaces come equipped with a natural, projectively flat connection. And this is, um, these projectively flat connections, in particular in a non-abelian case, were very, or, or sort of very much part of the geometric approach to Chern-Simons theory, you could say. Um, so when you think about Chern-Simons topological field theory, one of the things that that is supposed to offer you is a representation of the mapping class group, and in this geometric approach, that is obtained um, through these uh, through these connections. But in particular, um, from so in the in the abelian case, this connection is often referred to as the Mumford, or is sometimes referred to as the Mumford-Welters connection. even though it goes back much earlier, essentially, um, 
it's, it's essentially due to the fact that abelian theta functions satisfy a certain heat equation, and um, Mumford related that to, to representations of Heisenberg groups, and then Welter sort of gave the modern formulation of this um, in, terms of, um, in terms of a projectively flat connection. Um, so this is um, connection on bundles of abelian theta functions. And it is known that, um, it's not too hard to see from the construction, that the monodromy always has finite order. So this um, is not particularly hard to see, but as a result, it came a little bit as a surprise. Much later than, um, much later than after uh, Atia introduced this conjecture, that in the abelian case, um, so on the, abel the non-abelian side, you have a connection that is referred to as a, the Hitchin connection. That's on the bundles of the non-abelian theta functions. And then it was shown by uh, Masbaum. I don't remember exactly when that was, but I think it must have been around 2002, maybe. And by um, um, Laszlo. Oli and Zerger, much more recently, I think in 2013, that for G equal to SL2, the monodromy of this connection, so again, it's a projectively flat connection, but the monodromy of this connection always has elements in its image, uh, the monodromy representation has elements in its image of infinite order, except so, except for certain low level, le for, low, for low levels, so, um, um, elements of infinite order in monodromy. Except if L is one, two, four, or eight. And so, Masbaum was the first, he didn't take this geometric approach. He very much thought of Chern Simon's theory in terms of the um, uh, Reshetik and Tureyev invariants, thinking about skein theory, et cetera, like that. And so he, he was able to really just write down um, matrices for elements of the mapping class group, and he just played around with it, and they found that he got matrices of infinite order, um, except that his method broke down. The matrices that he, that he wrote down didn't work in this case. So he doesn't say anything about um, about these cases, and then Laszlo Pauli Zerger sort of repeated this uh, this work, um, really from the point of view that I'm taking, thinking in terms of uh, connections on these these vector bundles. Um, in some sense, because they were perhaps a little bit suspicious about Masbaum's work, but they um, or not about his methods, but um, about the results, um, and they were able to 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 reproduce it entirely uh, from um, from the geometry that I'll talk about more today. In particular, they have a, they had this very specific um, motivation that I, I'm not going to say much much about today. But essentially, this is for from from certain points of view, this is very unexpected behavior. In fact, um, even though there's there's still quite a few details missing, this this um, if this is true, it is believed that this is actually a counterexample to a certain um, conjecture of Grothendieck and Katz, um, which is why for 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 algebraic geometers, this was quite surprising. I mean, it's, there's some, some details missing to show um, that, that, that this is the case, but it's, it's believed um, that this is so, and that's why this, was, this came as a surprise. I mean, I mean <laughs> on the face of it, it definitely seems like this is not good news for this conjecture. But I'm not quite sure that, that, it, that it totally invalidates it.
I mean, I, I agree with you, but I, 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 I'm not quite sure that it 100% eliminates it. But it definitely seems to, seems to, sh to, to show that, that uh, non-abelian theta functions fundamentally behave different from abelian ones. Um, and so that, that seems to um, make this, uh, this conjecture a bit less likely. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about today is essentially just a case of level four. But I should also say that when I, very, when I first learned of this result, I thought that there would be some sort of cute argument behind it based on, on, uh, on real division algebras. But um, afterwards, more recently, um, the case of um, level eight has also been eliminated um, uh, by recent work of Esgard and Jorgensen. who sort of played a bit more with the matrix representation of Mussbaum and found that they could also find infinite order elements um, at level eight. So it just seems to be a matter of one, two, and four. Um, and so Mussbaum doesn't say anything about that, but our work is concerned with the case four. And uh, when I talk a little bit about strange duality, it will also become clear that, that at level one, directly from strange duality, um, you, you, you must have finite order because essentially you can write down an isomorphism between these things. Level two, I, I, I don't know anything about. Um, I gave this talk uh, some time ago in Oxford and afterwards Graham Siegel contacted me with some ideas um, about why it might also be true for level two, um, but I, I don't know if it's, it's I, I don't think it's settled at all, but so Graham Siegel had some ideas about level two, but um, None of us definitely have any idea. So it's a very sporadic behavior. The, the phenomenon that I'm going to describe today is something very, very particular that works only if certain numerical conditions are met and they happen to be met just in this particular case. Okay, so that was my, um, my second um, motivation and the main motivation uh, for what I want to say. But now I want to introduce or discuss a little bit this notion of higher rank prim varieties that I will need in, or, in order to, uh, to talk about this. And so this, this idea um, was really, um, is really due to Christian Pauli. Um, so I, maybe some of you have, have heard me talk about this in an earlier, um, or talk about an earlier version of this project when it was just with uh, with Thomas and Michele, but since we've we've joined forces with um, with uh, with Christian because he had been thinking already about these higher rank prim varieties. He likes to call them non-abelian prim varieties, but I th because it's so much a, a vector bundle, a type A phenomenon, I think that uh, higher rank prim varieties is um, a bit more uh, appropriate. So what is this? It's it's essentially a very straightforward um, notion. Yeah. For when um, I don't quite know. I, I, I mean, I think at least part of what we will say um, will go through. Yeah, I don't quite know. I would have to would have to think about it. Fixed trivial determinant, yes, but I. So part of the work, at least, uh, also goes goes through um, for for non uh, non uh, trivial determinant, fixed but non trivial determinant. But um, but yeah, so far we've only been focused on on the on the untwisted case. Okay, so Laura has already been talking about uh, pr or prim varieties, classical prim varieties um, that that you obtain once you have a spectral curve, which is going to be a ramified. Um, cover of a an, an Riemann surface that you start from, and sort of the most general definition is really in terms of this norm map. You take a kernel of a of a norm map, but when you go back to uh, to Mumford's original um, papers on prim varieties, he was much more limited in scope, and essentially he was just thinking about double covers um, of some Riemann surface. Um, so you take a double cover or you take some Riemann surface with an involution. And so you have a double cover. And in those cases, as was already mentioned also um, yesterday, 
you can introduce the prim variety simply as the, um, um, the fixed point locus on the Jacobian of the covering curve um, for under that involution. So you just pull back uh, bundles under the involution and you look at the fixed point uh, locus in the Jacobian and that's what your prim variety is. Um, and so you can now define a higher rank prim variety in the same way, you can just look at the locus of the locus of bundles in the modelized space of SLN bundles. You could even do it for GLN bundles as well, such that when you pull them back under your involution and you dualize them, that you get, um, maybe I should write it like this, you get your original bundle back. Um, and so, you know, you could say it's a very simple, straightforward um, thing to, um, to introduce. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that nobody has, has, has done this. We, we looked in the literature, we couldn't find any mention of it, but somehow this is, this is crucial for, um, for what I want to say today. So maybe I should uh, give a few properties of this. And again, this was essentially worked out by Pauli. And yeah, yeah. So in the, in the abelian case, you essentially have that, or the, the, that the prim variety gives you the transversal direction to the Jacobian of the curve downstairs inside of the Jacobian upstairs. So you can pull any line bundle on sigma back to the, to the cover. That gives you a map from the Jacobian here to the Jacobian here. Um, that's actually uh, an embedding. And you, the prim variety gives you a transversal direction. And in fact, the, of course, the um, bundles or the, these, um, the prim variety and the Jacobian downstairs intersect exactly in the, um, in the bundles that are self-dual. So uh, you're going to intersect in the two torsion points of the Jacobian here. Now, in, in this case, in the high rank case, you actually have to be a little bit more general because you can have, you will have a positive dimension of bundles that are um, self-dual. So, I can just say this, that um, So this is going to have positive dimension. Secondly, um, in general, when, in particular in the case when you have an unramified cover, the, when you restrict your um, polarizing line bundle over the Jacobian to the prim inside of it, you're going to find that uh, this polarization is no longer principal, and in, in particular in the case of an unramified cover, you find that you obtain, that you actually have a square root of your theta line bundle. So um, your polarization is of type 2, 2, 2, 2, and so you can find a, um, a square root. And this is also the case here. So if you have an unramified cover, and I'm going to be a little bit lazy today. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, yes, that's the case. That's the case. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to have to think a little bit about it. 
I mean, it's, it's definitely the case if you have something. Um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, yeah let, me, let me come back to you about that. Um, so, indeed, if you. Well, in, yeah, let me just uh, um, continue. So, so in this case, uh, then, like in the abelian case, I'm going to be a little bit lazy and, and write all the, the natural polarized, the natural um, um, ample line bundles uh, or ample generators all by L. Um, so when you take um, the theta line bundle on the Jacobian and you restrict it to the prim, or if you take the, the natural um, ample generator on this, on this higher rank prim, uh, sorry, if you take the, the natural ample generator on the moduli space of bundles and you restrict it to the prim, you're going to find uh, that this has a square root. So this guy can be realized as a determinant line bundle and, and, and the square root, as in the classical case, can be realized as a Pfaffian. Okay. So I've briefly spoke or I've mentioned already two of the three words in the title and now I'll say something about strange duality as well. Because that's essentially the, the other key property of these higher rank prim varieties is that you can also get strange duality for them. So I'll briefly introduce sort of vanilla strange duality, and I'll say a little bit about um, the various proofs that are out there in the literature uh, for it, because there's in particular one proof to Belcale that, um, that is very relevant for us. So, I want to say moduli space here, but I, I don't think that, that, that I mean, there's, there shouldn't be an objection for doing this on the moduli stack as well, in, uh, in the sense that Yeah, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. It's it's definitely on the moduli space, but I thought that it could be defined on the moduli. I mean, the determinant line bundle definitely exists on the stack. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, maybe I shouldn't make any statements. So, as before, I'm gonna fix a Riemann surface. genus G, and then I can write down a map from the moduli space of SUR bundles on this Riemann surface times the moduli space of, well, maybe I should say SLR bundles in algebraic geometry uh, terms, times the um, moduli space of SLK bundles of degree times G minus one to the moduli space of GLKR bundles of degree KR times G minus one, um, where I just tensor, I'd send, I take any pair, and I just send them to the tensor product. Now, when I pull back, so if I call this map tau, 
If I pull back um, my theta line bundle here, I can actually decompose it um, over here. And maybe here I should be just a little bit careful and discriminate between the line bundle and the divisor. So let me just for now write it like so. which is essentially where you start to see the particular um, phenomenon of switching of rank um, and duality happening. But essentially using this, um, you get a map from um, H0 of um, the latter modular space to the tensor product of the sections of this guy and this guy. And because we also have a canonical section here, essentially given by the theta divisor, and that's why it's important that we, that we put these degrees in here, um, you get a canonical element in here, defined, naturally defined up to scalars, and then it turns out that um, this element, which you can also interpret as a map from here to here, is um, an isomorphism, and that's what strange duality tells us. the data divisor is a natural map up to constants from H0 of MSLR of theta k. Maybe now I'll be a little bit floppier of G L K of K G minus one with O of theta R dual. And so the theorem strange duality says that this map is an isomorphism. So this theorem is, was proven um, by Prakash Belkale on the one hand and um, Alina Marian and Drago Joprea um, about seven, eight years ago, I think. Um, and in particular, the proof of Belkale is very relevant for us. So Belkale gave a proof in two steps. First, he proved it for generic Riemann surfaces uh, sigma, and then he showed how this relates to the um, Hitchin connection. So he showed that this map, when you think of this, actually not just as a map between vector spaces, but if you think about it as a map between bundles over the moduli space of curve, that um, both of them coming equipped with 
um, projectively flat connections that the map is um, essentially preserves these projectively flat connections and therefore has to be of constant rank. So therefore, if, in fact, if you just show that it's an isomorphism at one point, then uh, you show that it's an isomorphism everywhere. But actually, that's, I mean, he used it as a, as, as a um, tool in order to prove this, but in, in fact, the statement therefore becomes stronger. His statement is really that strange duality um, is, is um, an isomorphism, you could say, between two projective vector bundles over the moduli space of curves that preserves the connection. So the, the two connections are the same. And that's, uh, that's exactly what we want to use thereof. So, if you now think about the case of level one again, then of course you see immediately that the bundles over the moduli space of curves that you obtain, um, so now going back to level one, And in fact, I don't fully need this statement. The, um, the paper by Boville, Narasimhan, um, and uh, Raman, no, it's BNR. Uh, is it Boville, Narasimhan, Ramanan? Yeah. Um, it actually does this exactly in the case where, where k is equal to 1 um, using the, this Mumford approach to the connection. They already um, um, show that, and so that's sufficient to handle this case of level 1, but um, I want to take the, take the perspective that this um, extends naturally, because now we find that H0 of M of SLN at level 1 is isomorphic to H0 of level K abelian theta functions over the Jacobian, and we know that this connection here is always this finite order, and so therefore even the non-abelian one at level one always have to, has to have finite order as well. So strange duality just automatically tells you that at level one you always need to have, um, you always need to have finite order. But now I essentially want to uh, convince you, um, or what, we, um, what our project is about, is to say that actually with a little bit more work, or with a bit more work, you can also get this to go in um, for level four, but it becomes a little bit more more uh, complicated. But point-wise, the result was known uh, for quite some time by some early work um, of Pauli, joined separately with um, Ramanan and with um, Bill Oxbury where they had shown already how, at least point-wise, you can get a comparison between spaces of rank two uh, non-abelian theta functions at level four and um, abelian theta functions. So. So I think the Oxbury Pauli um, um, statement, or the Oxbury Pauli proof of what I'm going to write down was only again valid for generic curves. And then pa um, Pauli and Ramanan have a more general statement that they also actually established for all curves. So in some sense it's, um, it's a stronger one. But essentially what they show is that when you look at so now I'm, I'm just going to give up on being precise. I'm always just going to denote my line bundle by four, uh, by L, and it's always going to be sort of the obvious line bundle that, that you can think of. So here it's the ample generator of the Picard of the moduli space of um, SL2 bundles. But this space is, natu again, naturally um, isomorphic up to constants to a direct sum of spaces of abelian theta functions. Maybe here I should be a little bit more careful. So 
that is a statement that they have, and I should maybe indicate a few, say a few words here. So I'm looking at um, the space of even theta functions of level three over the Jacobian, as well as theta functions over all, or um, I'm looking at all prim varieties for all unramified covers. So I'm summing over all elements of two torsion in the Jacobian um, minus zero. So these are exactly, that's exactly one way to, to describe all the um, connected unramified covers of my original Riemann surface. So I look at all these unramified covers, I take the prim variety for all of them, and there look at um, the abelian theta functions given by looking at level three. So I take three times uh, the square root of the theta function that I have here. And again, I, I only look at the even theta functions. I dualize both of these spaces, and this is the isomorphism that they write down. So there's actually also an, an, um, a version of this for uh, non-trivial determinants, um, but we haven't worked on that, um, on that anymore. So this statement, the point wide statement, is definitely um, known also in more greater generality. But now I, what I want to do is take this statement, think about it in terms of bundles over, um, over the modelized space of curves, and try to say, and essentially what we say is that um, you also have a natural isomorphism between the connections on both sides. Um, any questions? about this. But so when you think about this, the first um, thought that you might have is, well, all of these connections are, are, are defined as projective connections, and actually here on the, um, on the, you know, this is just a point-wide statement, but you have this natural decomposition here that is occurring in the right-hand side, um, where each of these summands, at least, say, when you're thinking about um, Teichmuller theory, or locally, analytically locally on the modelized space of curves, your vector bundle is actually going to split. Um, I mean, if you want to, if you want to define this this globally, this is not going to be a vector bundle over the modelized space of curves, of course, because um, these bundles would be would be um, or these prim varieties would be flipped by by diffeomorphisms. Um, but uh, at least locally, uh, immediately you can say, well, there's a problem here because I have a projective ambiguity. So I would like to sort of take a, a little side tour um, to sort of show how you, how you bypass that, uh, that, not, that, that problem in a very natural way, because I think it's something that really should be known much more wider to geometers. Um, so there's, there's a concept that was essentially came out of Moscow in the, um, in the 1980s of uh, twisted D modules that completely sort of solves at least this, this, um, this projective ambigu ambiguity. So I don't exactly know who this is due to. I, I believe it's um, Balinson, um, Bernstein, Bernstein, and uh, maybe Schechtman, but in any case, I would say Moscow in the 1980s, uh, where this, this notion was um, introduced. And so for our purposes, I would say that a twisted D module is sort of a variation on the concept of a connection that relates to a projective connection the way a representation of a central extension of a group relates to a projective representation of a group. So maybe I should just write that down as, a, as an analogy. In fact, it's a very precise analogy that um, I will um, explain um, as well. So uh, suppose that you know, if you want to think about the projective representation of a group gamma, then, um, well, sometimes it's easier to think about a linear representation of a central extension of your group. And you can already see that, in particular, if suppose that you have a number of projective representations of a group. And now you want to think about, um, you know, you can ask the question, do I actually get a projective representation on the sums of the corresponding vector spaces? And 
when you're thinking about projective representations, that's sort of a, a question that's, for, you know, that you can't really formulate an answer very cleanly. You really have to sort of look at how these representations are defined, and then it can get a little bit messy. But when you're thinking about um, linear representations, uh, ordinary representations of a central extension, it's a, it's, it becomes a much more um, trivial um, question. Now you can just say, well, obviously, if I'm going to get linear representations of the same representation, such that the center acts um, in the same way, with the same weight, then obviously, naturally, I also get a projective representation in, um, of, the, of the, um, uh, the direct sum. And so that's the, the, the similar phenomenon that we're going to see here. So, so I would say here, this chorus, this is... Um, These two relate uh, the way that the projective connection relates to a twisted D module um, in, in this particular setting. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about a very benign case. I'm not going to start talking about um, Riemann-Hilbert correspondences or perverse sheaves. I'm just going to talk about uh, twisted D modules over a smooth base. Um, it's actually a very natural notion. And so maybe I can just very briefly recap. So I, I you know, this, the... the the, the other point that I want to emphasize is that when people talk about the Hitchin connection, um, very often that is uh, done in differential geometric terms, but you can do that also purely alg algebraic geometrically, and that's what I will do as well. So if I can just briefly recall how you think about um, connections in algebraic geometry, if you want. And this is essentially just going back to Atiyah's old paper from the 1950s. We did it complex analytically, but it's the same, uh, the same story. So suppose that I have some vector bundle E over some algebraic or uh, holomorphic vector bundle over base a, um, X, and I can look at the following short exact sequence of coherent sheaves, where the middle one consists of the differential operators of degree at most one. And then at the end, I take my symbol map that um, makes me end up in the tangent sheaf um, tensored with the um, endomorphism sheaf. And now I can actually take a sub-sequence sub of this guy by just restricting myself to the tangent sheaf tensored with the identity here, and then I take the inverse image of the symbol map. And, in, you know, this is just something completely general that you can write down. And now you can just say that a connection is nothing but a splitting of this lower um, sequence. Because essentially what you're doing is you take any section of the tangent sheaf, any vector field, and you associate a certain differential operator with it, which is the covariant derivative. Um, and in fact, this is going to be flat exactly. All this is actually a an, an, an short exact sequence of, of sheaves of Lie algebras. And when this is actually when this, this section map is also preserving the um, the Lie brackets, then it's going to be a flat connection. So just an alternative way of formulating this, but this is now. Um, convenient for us because we, um, we can also formulate projective connections very easily in this setting. If you think about it, what is a projective connection or projectively flat connection? It's going to be given exactly by um, local, um, by local sections um, of, um, of my tangent sheaf or covariant derivatives associated with these, but there, I, I can have a little bit of ambiguity because when I, when I try to glue them together, I can have some scalar differences. And if you think about this, the way you can formulate that is simply by saying that we now look at a um, certain um, subsheaf or subsection that goes like this. Again, I write down my same. Short exact sequence.
And now I just have to um, take an um, extension in here by my structure sheaf um, of the tangent sheaf. That's just another way of saying what a projective connection is. And if you have an ordinary connection, then essentially what you do is you take the um, subsheaf of this guy that is generated by the image of the section as well as um, the image of the, um, of, the, of the structure sheaf. But now the basic idea... Is that? No, no. I'm just saying I, I take a I take a subsheaf in here that gives me an extension of my tangent sheaf. Sorry, this is just a data. So, so if I have an ordinary connection, if I have an ordinary connection, the projective connection that it in, induces is I just take the sheaf generated by the image of my splitting here and the structure sheaf. But in, in general, you just look at the sheaf that is generated by your local covariant sections. But now what the D module does, or what the twisted D module is for in our setting, is the idea that what we want to do is we want to associate covariant derivatives no longer to, the tan to, to sections of the tangent sheaf, but rather I want to take a central extension of my tangent sheaf, uh, and in particular the, the natural ones um, that we are going to work with are the ones that are obtained from line bundle. Basic idea is that you replace um, the tangent sheaf by a central extension obtained from a line bundle lambda. And so what you can do then is you can take what is sometimes called the Atia sequence or the Atia algebraoid. You get just a natural sequence that um, gives you the order one differential operators on that line bundle, uh, where this is just a symbol map again, and in the morphism, of course, just a structure sheaf in that case. And so now what you, what you want is just a map from this guy to the sequence that I already wrote down before. where you now associate a covariant derivative, if you want, no longer with the section of the, of the tangent bundle, no longer with the vector field, but rather with the section of the central extension. And so again, here I want to have the identity going to, um, or this should just be the, the identity tensored with the identity, if you allow my abuse of notation, and the, you can show that necessarily um, you map the structure sheaf to the structure sheaf, but not necessarily by the identity, but rather you multiply by a locally constant function that we will call the weight. And so the basic point that I um, want to make is that so it, I, should, I should also say that definitely when it came to, to the, the conformal blocks, these, these, model, these um, Hitchin connections also have an alternative interpretation in terms of conformal blocks. And there, this circle of ideas was definitely much, much better known. In fact, it was known that you can realize the Westminino-Witten connection as a twisted D module where the line bundle that you take 
is the um, Hodge determinant line bundle, and the um, the weight that then occurs is half the central charge of your um, of your conformal theory. Um, but the point that I would like to make is that. And I, I, again, we didn't find this uh, written down anywhere, even though it's, it's quite natural, that also the Hitchin connection can be constructed in this way. Um, and so the, normally the Hitchin connection is, I don't have time to, to explain this, but the Hitchin uh, connection is obtained through um, a heat operator, or rather a projective heat operator, but you can just look at that definition and again twist, um, so yeah, maybe I shouldn't write it down, but there's a natural definition of a twisted heat operator, and just like a project, an, an ordinary heat operator is going to spit out a connection, a projective heat op uh, operator is going to spit out a, um, a projective connection. If you twist the heat operator, what comes out is one of these twisted uh, D modules. But in particular, what is, what is very important is that now you can see that if you have a number of these guys, where the weight is actually the same, so if you, sorry, if you have a bunch of vector bundles that have a um, twisted D module for the same line bundle lambda and for the same weight, that naturally you get one on the sum as well. So that is sort of a crucial part or a crucial tweak that we need to do in order to handle these direct sums. It's, you know, once, once you know about it, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, straightforward, but uh, I think this is a technique that is much more known to people in geometric representation theory rather than, uh, than people who think about moduli of bundles. Uh, but th so this is sort of something that uh, was that's very convenient for us that allows us to tackle all this projective ambiguity um, of the bundles. So maybe I should now um, say give the, so the basic idea of the general uh, proof. About five minutes left, so I can't say too much. But the, the, the basic idea is essentially that you use first the fact that when you, so you can associate, using the adjoint uh, representation, excuse me? Uh, so now I'm, I want to show why uh, that Oxbury Pauli morphism that I wrote down, so that's, that's our, you know, if, if you can show that that's actually an isomorphism of bundles um, with, um, that preserves the connection, then you automatically again get that at level four, you need to have finite, finite monitor V, so, so, so let me say this of, of global, global version of Oxbury Pauli. So now, um, yeah, so if you take the adjoint map, then um, you can associate with every SL2 bundle an SL4, an SL3 bundle. And this is this map that's completely uh, straightforward. Of course, you just use the adjoint map, but it has a particular property that this is um, what is called um, a conformal map. So this is essentially, um, you can also say this gives me a map from SL2 to SL3. And this is conformal. And that's just, I'll, I'll say in a second what it is, but it's a very particular numerical coincidence or a numerical occurrence that can happen when a certain parameter uh, when certain parameters uh, match up. So, um, so when I think about this in terms of, of moduli spaces, I get a map from moduli space of SL2 bundles to the moduli space of SL3 bundles. But when I pull back my ample generator, I actually get um, the fourth power of my ample generator here, um, which is what is called, in general, this number is what is called the Dinkin index. Um, so. And so, when you what you need to calculate the numerical um, condition to have a conformal map is that when you calculate the central charge for SL3 and the central central charge for SL2 times the Dinkin index, it just happens that they match up. So when I take the dimension of, in this case, um, SL2 times, my, times um, the Dinkin index over the dual Coxeter number um, plus um, my Dinkin index 
In fact, I should think of this as the, the Dinkin index times the level, but that doesn't matter. So when I do that for SL2, I get 3 times 4 divided by 2 plus 4. So that's 12 over 6, that's 2. But when I also do that by for SL3, so now I just, my Dinkin index goes away, I just think about my central charge at level 1, I get 8 times 1 divided by 3 plus 1, and that's also 2. So this is just a little um, coincidence, but this coincidence exactly allows us to switch from SL2 bundles to SL3 bundles and have a map that preserves the connection. So you can think about this in terms of conformal, in con terms of conformal field theory, because if you think in terms of the West Zumino Witten con um, uh, connection, what is driving that uh, West Zumino Witten uh, connection is, is an, um, a gadget from representation theory that is, um, that is called the uh, Siegel Sugawara construction. And the Siegel Sugawara construction gives you a map from, essentially gives you a map from the Virasoro algebra into the affine Lie algebra associated with these guys. And the central charge is nothing but um, the weight that the central element of the Virasoro obtains. And so what happens is when you have maps like these, you get um, associated maps between the affine. Uh, Lie algebras, and the fact that this, this numerical condition holds tells you that the Virasoro algebra, um, that you have a, a commuting triangle if you want, um, if you also uh, stick in these two maps from the Virasoro algebra. And so because that, that triangle commutes, when you think what happens to the, the West Amino witten uh, um, uh, connection, you find that these connections match up. But the same is true for the Hitchin connection. So these central charges also show up in, uh, the, the, in the Hitchin connection, essentially because the Hitchin connection, and again, I don't have time to explain this, but the Hitchin connection is determined by its symbol. The symbol is just ser duality um, applied to the second, um, the, the, the quadratic element of the Hitchin vibration. So the quadratic element of the Hitchin vibration is giving you a map from, if you want, the cotangent bundle to the moduli space of curse times itself, into um, the quadratic differentials, if you take ser duality of that, you actually get um, a, a certain map. And the theorem of Hitchin, one way to interpret it is to say that if you take that map and you normalize it by the central charge, then there is a unique um, connection that actually has that as, a, as the symbol map or a unique heat operator, rather, that has that as the symbol map. And so the fact that we have this numerical matching, this conformal condition, tells us that we can actually go from SL2 to SL3 and um, have, a, a, have a map that preserves the connections. So that's the, the first element. And then the second element is that once you're on SL3, then, um, so now you... Um, I'm really running over time. So the second element um, is that so you, so you switch from SL2 to SL3, and then you apply this um, strange duality. Both the vanilla kind, but also, also the one uh, involving all these prim varieties. So the, the prim varieties that I, that I wrote down and these higher rank prim varieties, it turns out that they also satisfy a strange duality. And again, the strange duality map that you get there is also projectively flat. So you take all, uh, you apply strange duality to all of the possible prims. And so the, the, the final outcome is that um, the Oxbury Pauli map or isomorphism is a global isomorphism. And in fact, it's a global of automorphism of twisted D modules. But in particular, as a result, you get that it um, gives you um, that the projectively flat uh, connections induced by them are the same. And as a corollary, you get that also at level four, the, um, the connection is essentially determined entirely in terms of abelian connections. I've already gone over time, so I guess I should stop here. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. 
No, 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 no. The, the, the SL3 level, I'm not saying that this map is an isomorphism. This, uh, because the, the bundles are not going to have the same dimension. But uh, I'm going to get, in fact, a sub-bundle, but the sub-bundle preserves the connection. So, um, but, but then I get, then after I apply strange duality, I go from the SL3 one to various um, uh, abelian ones. But again, then I have to take sub-bundles there when I take, take a plus. So in some sense, this is an intermediate step, but the intermediate step is not, is not an isomorphism of vector bundles. Um, but it, it, it does preserve my connection. So it's going to be a projection. This, the intermediate step is, is, is going to, to give me projections and embeddings, and these preserve the connection. But I know that when I compose everything that I have an isomorphism. So everything that I'm saying here, I mean, we already know that we have an isomorphism of vector bundles that we actually already get. But um, this intermediate step allows us to, to, to say something about the connections and to say that the connection that we get is the same. Yeah. But so, so the, 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 the one thing that, it, that this says is that, um, that uh, the, the two conformal field theories, that um, you know, one, one is going to give you a bundle embedded uh, in the other over the modulized space of bundles, and that that, is, uh, that that embedding preserves the connection. Uh, yes, yes, but that's not what I'm talking about here. This is the central charge. This is not uh, the Valinda formula. Yes, yes, that's why I have one here. One here and one here. So, um, so, what I'm, I'm, so with every SL2 bundle, I obtain an SL3 bundle. So I get a map from the modular space of SL2 bundles or the modular stack of SL2 bundles to the modular stack of SL3 bundles. I take my, my uh, determinant line bundle here and I pull it back. And then I say, what multiple of the, of the determinant line bundle do I get here? And I find that it's the fourth power. Yes. Yes. And then I switch to SL3 at, at level one, and then I apply to, uh, strange duality, and then I get the Jacobian. Um, yeah, now I have to think about. Um, um, yeah, I would to 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 check the the Verlinde formula. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, sir. Um, yeah. I, 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 so the one thing I, sh I, I should mention is that even when you just take take the the, the Verlinde formula for this guy, it, it it behaves atypically in that it just spits out integers. And in fact, if you if you if you lump them together in the right way, you get exactly the decomposition that you get also from from the target of the the Oxbury power. But uh, yeah, we'd have to think a little bit about uh, about how it exactly uh, embeds there. I mean, I guess, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we should 